Do you hear me? Do you hear me? Oh, good. You can hear me. Now, time for the reveal. Welcome to my book review channel, where we talk about the complete abomination that this book is. In fact, we're turning this from a book review channel into a trick shot channel. Oh, missed. Everything's all right, honey. Okay, there we go. Welcome, welcome to Management 1050, talking about China. There we go. Here we are. We're excited. This lecture, man, so many of these lectures, I just wish that we were together on these. So that way you could see. I, I just love seeing your reactions. I love seeing... It's just such a good lecture, this one. So some of the other ones are fantastic as well. I, I'm just excited. Okay, finally getting your reactions on my, my book review. I'm glad to see that I am not alone on how awful this book is. Um, hey, yes, and I did get a haircut. Thank you very much. Eventually, we do have to cut our hair in quarantine. Isn't that great? Um, okay, uh, we are going to get into China. We're going to be talking about about history of China from about 1950 up to the present. And I'll give you an explanation there for just a second. For those of you who are my students in Management 1050, let me remind you, student evaluations open tomorrow. Please go fill them out. Go check out that Canvas announcement to see what the deal is there. Um, I need those from you. Please, and please, 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 especially those watching right now, hopefully that means you're somebody who has been enjoying this class. I really need you to fill out these evaluations because I think uh, I think we're going to have a lot of people complaining this semester. So I would just really appreciate it if you guys sent me your feedback on this class. And maybe you're going to complain about it as well. But it would be helpful as well because... Who knows, maybe the fall is going to be online too. Hopefully not, but you just never know at this rate. So um, I could use feedback on how to make this class better for the fall. China. Let's talk about China. This is from a New York Times article about 18 months ago. Let's see, the, the link is down the corner, November 18th, 2018. So you know, roughly 18 months ago, the land that failed to fail, right? China, uh, super important right now with what's going on in the news, right? So let's understand a little bit more about where China came from, why it is the way it is today. Here is the, this is, I showed you these pictures uh, in the lecture on the Panic of 1907, right? When I talked about the Roaring Twenties. And here is um, Times Square, New York City, um, on the left, this is about, I forget the date, 1920-ish, and this is the Empire State Building right next to it. Empire State Building, by the way, was built in like months, which is just mind-blowing to think about how quickly they constructed this thing. Yes, these aren't exactly what these things look like today, like Times Square is missing, creepy Elmo standing out there giving people hugs, but... We can largely recognize New York City from about 100 years ago, right? Like, that looks pretty similar to what we see today in New York City. China, on the other hand, this is Beijing in 1950. So this is 70 years ago now. Um, looks like a suburban area. Nothing crazy. Um, you might have kind of some buildings back there. Picture of Beijing now. Just huge change in Beijing from 1950 to today. And of course, all over China, massive development that has occurred in the past couple of decades. So why do we care about China? We have spent this entire class talking about the United States, where the United States started, how it got here, and we've had these models that have come in. Why are we all of a sudden switching gears to China? Well, I put this lecture in here because I think this is something that you should understand. I think this is important. Why is it important? It's the world's largest economy. That doesn't mean it's the world's richest economy, right? Like GDP per capita is still much lower than the United States, but still large. 
its performance affects the United States. We're going to talk about that towards the end of this lecture, but what happens in China happens in the United States. Now, obviously, today we're living that in this really strange way of something happened in China, and now it's affecting us. We are on this chat right now because of something that happened in China, right? Like, we should understand what happens in China. Oh, my goodness, guys. What we're going to talk about today, it, oh, my gosh, such a parallel to what's happening today. What, I, I hope that you guys are like thinking, wow, I'm so glad I took this class this semester because it helps put so many things in context. You're gonna see this, this beautiful connection between what happened in China in the late 1950s and what's happening today. It's a nice contrast to the United States. That's another reason why we go through China is because we can look at what's ha what happened in the US and we can look at what happened in China. China is a very different, very, very different world, totally different than what happened in the United States. And so we want to understand more about growth and economics by looking at China. And if you think about, this is, the class is called Foundations of Business Leadership. Remember, the United States is a world business leader. The foundations are, what are the history behind that? Now, you know, China is a business leader. Shouldn't we understand the foundations there? And what can China tell us about the models that we've gone through, right? So we've discussed things like inclusive economic institutions. We've talked about relying on the market. But today, China is a communist country. It's managed to grow faster than any country in the world. What does that say about our models? What does that say about the things we've learned here? Are, are we totally off base? Are we, is this consistent with, with what we believe? We're going to go through this, and that's why it's so nice to contrast this with the United States, because China has such a different culture, such a different history, and yet if we can pick out things that are similar or different, it's going to help us understand what contributes to economic growth. Big questions that we're going to address today. This, these big questions are like the value proposition. How did China achieve unprecedented economic growth and become the world's largest economy? What happened to China under Mao Zedong? What happened to China under Deng Xiaoping? And how has China's growth affected the United States? These are the things that we want to look at. These are the questions that we want to answer. And hopefully you come out of this lecture with an understanding of what's going on here, which then you can hopefully then apply when you look at other things in the world. I like this lecture a lot. Oh, it's usually so good to just see you guys. I miss you guys. I love sitting next to you guys and talking with you and seeing your reactions when I make terrible jokes that don't land. Thank you. Anyway, what happened to China under Mao Zedong? What happened here? Mao Zedong has, um, so this is Mao. Um, Mao has, so you see Z-E-D-O-N-G is how the way I'm spelling it. Sometimes you'll spell it, see it spelt T-S-E-T-U-N-G, Setung, I think. That's the problem with trying to translate names from Chinese into English is that you have to, you have to make judgment calls on it. So uh, if you see Setung, that's the same thing as Setung. Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm not a Chinese expert. What happens? The history of today's China begins with Mao. Okay? He was the chairman of the Chinese Communist Party from 1943 to his death in 1976. And within China, his reputation is split between reverence and controversy. By the way, I'm sitting here talking about how much I miss you. Um, class registration opens up this week. Um, Econ 3600. Come take it. We're going to talk about development economics. I've already seen I've got... 49 spots in the class, nine of them have been taken so far, but you know, hopefully, hopefully we can join. I'm trying to make this class just an amazing class for you guys. So I hope that you will come join this class. Oh, you guys are so sweet seeing all these things in the chat. I miss you too. Okay, Mao Zedong, his reputation is split between reverence and controversy. So this is a um, statue, is that what you call it? This is a monument to Mao uh, in some remote village in China. And I mean, look at this front row right here. This front row is apartments and 
uh, you've got these uh, these houses. Sorry, someone said speak Creole. I've got a surprise for you guys on the whole Creole thing, by the way. Mafeo Serzi avec Blanqui Palais Creole. Okay, so then you have this just a massive, massive monument, and it is a strapping monument. Like this, this is a good look. Like this is totally. Let's. That's Mao as we typically depict him, and this is like handsome Mao. This is like cover of Twilight type Mao, right? This is a very loving picture of him. By the way, you've got all these people giving me such kind feedback in the chat. Let me uh, let me say, in your student evaluations, maybe in your comment section, you might have some ideas that you could pitch to the administration. You know, Logan Peak looks fantastic and everything, but you know, maybe we could just like make it a little better. I don't know. Oh, you can't quite see this. So there we go. Look at how nice Logan Peak would look under that. I think... I think the Chinese got a few things right, right? This is a giant Mao statue that just appeared in Chinese uh, countryside. Oh, man. I forgot. So Logan is what? Sorry, guys. I keep getting distracted. Um, Logan's asking if we can just speak Creole today. You, oh, man. Logan, stay tuned for the last lecture. Okay. Here is, I mean... Mao is just massive in this, right? Those are trees back there. Let me again expand this so you can appreciate how big this is. Those are trees. Of course, they're not massive trees, right? Those look like they're still pretty young. I, you can see a house over there on the right. This is a massive monument, huge, crazy monument that just appears. Some people just constructed it in the middle of nowhere in this countryside. Crazy stuff, right? Well, then just two days later, three days later, you can't, if you go look at these dates, one of them is January 5th, the other one is January 8th, the giant Mao statue is removed from the village, okay? This is a huge change. And uh, so some people love Mao so much that here they are put up this crazy statue, and yet then it gets suddenly removed. What is it? What is this reputation that Mao has? Why is it that some people just love him so much? Why is it some people hate him so much? You know, I'm not going to be be able to quite get into why do people love him so much. However, we can get into possibly why people don't like him so much. This gets to the rise of the CCP, the Chinese Communist Party came to power in 1949, and their goal was to transform China from a backward agrarian nation into a civilized and progressive industrial nation, right? Take them from agriculture into industry. We've seen this goal before, right? That's ha Hamilton's goal. Hamilton's goal was let's get out of agriculture, or at least let's get into this new world of industry. China has the same goal. Um, the problem here is that Chinese agriculture was just not very productive. Having productive capita grain output in 1952, 220 kilograms per person. Just for, like, for me, that doesn't really mean anything. So let me give you a comparison. The Soviet Union, a communist country, in 1928, produced 480 kilograms of grain per person, right? So in 1928, 14 years earlier, 24 years earlier, now that I'm thinking about that, I've got that messed up. Sorry about that. They were producing more than twice as much grain per person in the country. Okay? So um, the, gov <laughs> the government, sorry, it's, are you, guys, you guys do some good stuff in the chat. So I love your conversations about uh, <laughs> Chatting up. Yep, this is great. All right. So government was not investing in agriculture. That's one of these problems here. Only 8% of state investment went to agriculture, um, which employed about 80% of the labor force. Okay, right. So this is the largest contribution. This is, this is the biggest sector in the economy, and yet very little of the investment is going towards improving agriculture. You need agriculture so you can feed the people working in industry. Because if you're starting, if you're building machines, 
you're not directly feeding anybody, right? So you need to be able to get food from somewhere, either from your own country or you can trade and have it brought in. But usually before you can get up to that point where you're trading for it, you need, you need people to feed you on your way there, okay? 52% of the state's investment was going to industry. Huge focus on industry. So then CP, CCP is in power and they focus on land reform. This is the, they think this is the solution to becoming more productive in agriculture. We're going to redistribute the land, taking land from some people and giving it to others. That's going to be the goal. Right? And hopefully by redistributing the land, it's going to be very productive that way. Economically, it's a little hard to predict what the outcome is. There's some evidence that maybe smaller farms are going to be more productive. Um, I personally, if you look at the economy today around the world, the most productive farms are those that are large scale and they are including mechanization on there. So I think economically, it's hard to predict what the outcome from land distribution is going to be. But politically, large benefits, right? Land re redistribution has huge benefits. This is, you take the people who are most likely to challenge you, the rich landowners, right? So this is the CCP. The CCP is sitting there like, if we're going to maintain political power, our biggest threat are the people who have money, the, the rich landowners. If we take the land from them, small class, and give it to most of the other people, then you can convince the people to who are poor agricultural laborers to support you. One of the like worst parts about this land reform, so it's not just, hey, we're going to take your land and give it to the other people. This is, we are going to kill you and give it to the other people. And not just the government's going to kill you. The CCP thought, you know what? People will be more invested and more excited about our government if we let them kill the landowners. Horrible to think. So you have these peasants being given permission, like not even just giving per permission, they're being set up by the government to say, here, kill this landlord and then we'll redistribute your land and you can be a true member of the Communist Party. It is just so sad. There, there are so many parts of this lecture that are just so sad um, when we get through them. Some, I mean, they've got this like dark humor to them as well. They're kind of funny. I'm sorry. By the fall of 1952, 43% of China's cultivated land was redistributed to about 60% of the peasants. So large-scale redistribution. Lots of people owning their own land here, right? And that's, that's one of the things. It's during this first land reform, people were actually owning the land. We're not like when we think about communism today, this is this kind of like they're, they're moving towards communism, but they're saying, hey, let's give people ownership of this land. And there's some evidence that this does initially boost agricultural production. But by 1953, there was a crisis. Grain prices were increasing while grain supply was decreasing. Now, this isn't a surprise, right? Supply goes down. Where is this thing? Yes. Oh, oh no. I'm here. I'm here. Okay. I mean, all my Econ 1500 students can draw this, right? Let's do Q, P, K. There you go. There's your supply and demand graph, right? This is saying supply is decreasing. So, uh, oh, there's my supply. Here's supply. Boom. What's going to happen? Oh, what do you know? Prices are increasing, right? That's, that's standard economics, right? Supply goes down. Price is going to go up. Okay, not surprising. That is the way the system works. Mao, on the other hand, says, yeah, no, system, system shouldn't work like this. So he thinks market prices were counterproductive to socialist goals. Like these things, they're just really cramping my style here. So his solution is like, we shouldn't have prices anymore. In fact, we should have uh, we should organize into collectives. So they're now shifting, they're doing another land reform. They had, they moved, they, they redistributed the land but kept the land private. Now, collective. It's going to be owned by everyone. Um, so the government is going to control the production, distribution, and consumption of food. There's no private property, no private transactions. Everything 
controlled by the government. Grain production, households are going to work on a communal plot. This is owned by the government. Everybody goes and works in the same spot. And it's going to be monitored by the communist officials. There's no private storage allowed. So you can't like, oh, I'm going to buy. You can't, you can't hoard toilet paper in this economy, guys. Can you imagine the terribleness? You can't hoard toilet paper in this kind of world. It, truly, like, you know, that I'm joking there, right? But here we go. We have, you know, oh, I, I want to buy, I think I'm going to need a few extra things next week. I should get a few of those so I don't have to worry about going to the store, going to these things. No, no private storage allowed. And food is only available in communal kitchens. Like, you don't even produce your own food most of the time. This is, there, there must have been some personal production of food, as we'll see in a few slides, because they were doing something there. But mostly, you go to these communal kitchens, that's where your food is given, which of course is just scary. When you think about like the kind of punishment, think about how much control is over your life here. You do something wrong, you step out of line, they can just stop you from going into these kitchens. Like, what are you going to do? You don't have any savings, you don't have any way to support your family, I mean, this is just scary stuff. No migrating allowed. Um, you have to stay in your collective. That means, you know, you can't look at, oh, I want to go to uh, this village over here. I'm trying to think of like a good example. I don't know what. I mean, this is this is what happened. Uh, like, there's a little bit of this kind of control going on today, right? Like Wuhan when it was having uh, the virus outbreak, and they just <laughs> they clamped down on the city, um, th suddenly this is like what life is like. It, it's not just in an emergency pandemic situation. This is all the time. You have no control. You're not allowed to leave unless I'm sure you could get permission up the, up the chain. So this is agricultural value under collectivization. You see, I mean, I don't want to read too much into this. It's just a time series graph. But if you can see, you know, you start off in 1950, pretty high value of agriculture, and it just kind of goes down over time. You see a little bit of, you know, rises and falls. But by 1957, agriculture is pretty low value. Like, it's just not doing that well. Um, it also, like, these, this collectivization kind of came in waves. It made everything really unpredictable. People just weren't able to, to make the investments they needed on their farms. And so you see this, this large decrease. Let's see, this is about, this is more than 10%. This looks like a 15% decrease in agricultural value under collectivization, okay? This is just time series. You know, we need, I don't have the counterfactual here, right? Like we don't have the Marty McFly world where we get to see what happens if they had not gone through er, collectivization. But... It gives us a little bit of um, a clue. You know, it's suggestive at least. Okay, let's get to agricultural procurement. This gets to the series of just a series of unfortunate events. Is that the right thing to say here? Terrible series, by the way. First couple books, great. The ending, awful. I just cannot believe how bad that series ended. Okay, agricultural procurement. Um, even, remember, even though most of the country works in agricultural sector, the government was focused on industrializing. Now, to get this industrial, you don't have industry yet. You're relying on other countries to get the equipment you need to industrialize, right? So how are you going to get that from other countries? How, like, what do you do? Well, we have trade, right? We have international trade where we're going to, we need to send stuff to those countries, and in return, they will send us their machines. So what could we possibly send them? Well, if we're an agricultural country, the only thing we have is agriculture, right? So we're going to have to send grain or some sort of other agriculture out to another country, and in return, they will give us uh, machines. So we have this agricultural economy. We need to get Food, we need to get their food and send it to other countries. Oh, and by the way, 
we're also going to be moving all these workers into the industrial sector, and we need to feed them. So we need to take more agriculture from you and and give it to the people who are working. Right? Man, I sometimes it just feels better to draw this. I know I'm saying it, and maybe this isn't clarifying anything at all, but like here here's Mr. Farmer dude. You can tell because he has that cool farmer's hat. And then here's like, I don't know, let's say the Americans. Okay, and here are... Uh, this is somebody who has like lots of dirt on his face because he's working in the factory, right? Whoop. Okay, these this guy. So these guys need food, so we need to send f grains to them. Here's my lovely grains, and in return, they're gonna send uh, probably not to the farmer, right? But to China, just generally, they're gonna send machines. This is a machine, or you know, Harry Potter. I don't know. And we also have people who are working in industry. You can't eat steel. So what are you going to do? Well, you have to also take grain from the farmers and feed the people who are working in the factories. So what are these guys going to eat? What are, what are they supposed to eat if everything is leaving? Well, they're going to eat what comes from, I mean, something. They have to eat something, right? Uh, oh, and I forgot, there's some storage. Storage, here's a silo. Okay, there we go. Now it's complete. We've got other countries. We have to trade with them to get, uh, to get machines. We have to give factory workers because they're making steel or they're making other things. And then we have silos, storage. These guys have to eat something, right? So we also need some food for them. What are we going to do here? Well, you know, obviously they have some food there, but like a lot of that food is leaving and they're just having to give it away because the government's taking it from them. I can't imagine anything terrible happening as a result. This gets us to the great leap forward. The government's goal for industrial, industrial, industrialization amplifies in 1957. November 18th, 1957, Mao announces that China will produce more steel than Britain in 15 years, right? So there, he's saying in 15 years, in 1972, we will be a bigger steel producer than Britain. And Britain's one of the biggest steel producers at the time. So, okay, fine. 15 year goal. Great. You know, got to stretch for something, right? But the, by the next year, Mao's like, no, it's only going to take one year. We're going to do this by next year. They're like, Hold on. China basically doesn't produce any steel at this point. No steel. And they're like, okay, we're going to go from like no steel to being the world's leading producer of steel. I mean, I know politicians that have dumb ideas and just speak as if they've never put a thought into their words. But I mean, this is like really up there on that level. This is really challenging them. So in 1958, this is what the Great Leap Forward is. The Great Leap Forward is this idea of we're going to go from zero to number one in just a year. So in 1958, the state recruits 21.9 million state workers to, ex to support the expansion of industry. That's twice the size of the industrial labor force in 1957. Of all the people who were working in 1957, you have now doubled that to have people working in the industry. And 10 million of those came from the rural labor force. Do I have this map here? Yeah, 10 million people. That is like every single adult in Arizona, New Mexico, Utah, Colorado, Wyoming, Montana, Idaho, and Washington. Every single adult in all of those states were suddenly put into one job. That is crazy to think. That is insane to think of the, the, about how many people that the government just says, boom, you are going into industry. Um, that, that's just the 10 million rural workers. They also had this idea of, well, we need to be able to produce steel. So let's have these backyard steel furnaces. Now it's time for me to see how, oh, I need to move this up. I've got a great YouTube video for you guys. I've actually got two great YouTube videos for you. Let's watch this one. Hopefully the audio comes through clearly.
most ambitious goal of the Great Leap Forward, Mao told the Chinese that production of steel had to double in one year. And instead of producing this just from heavy industry, the energy and idealism of the peasants was to be mobilized again. Small furnaces were built in villages and backyards across the country. They collected any scrap they could find. They melted down doorknobs, wash basins, tools. As the fever grew, people gave up their cooking walks. Forests were decimated to fuel the furnaces 24 hours a day. All over China, almost everyone, even medical doctors, neglected their normal jobs to answer the call. But even those taking part began to see it was following. All we did was make steel and nothing else. We didn't produce anything useful. How could we? We dug holes in the ground and tried to produce steel. It was all such a waste of time. All right. Hopefully, let's... Let's see what this chat says on whether people were actually even able to hear this. Okay, audio is working good. Fantastic. Okay, so here's, I mean, this is, this is nuts, right? Hey, guys, we want to become the world's leading steel producer. So you know what we're going to do? Everybody just go dig a pit in your backyard, start melting down metal, and we'll call that steel. What are we going to use this steel for? Nothing, obviously. This is garbage. This is garbage that they're creating. And yes, they're kicking out their doctors. They're saying like, hey, doctors, it is more important for you to go melt down metal in your backyard than it is for you to treat people, right? This is where just, man, markets are so important here, right? Like how value, like, can I draw this? I don't know. I don't think drawing, I just like have this instinct, like I just want to start drawing things, but I don't know if it's going to be clear. We have prices, prices, uh, oh, look, we've got someone commenting on, uh, on this, there we go. Um, so prices are going to tell us how valuable something is, how many resources we should dedicate towards that, right? Like today I mentioned, have I mentioned, so we really need face masks today because there aren't enough in the world. And so what are people doing? They are, I mean, we've got Under Armour. Under Armour is making face masks. Brooks Brothers, a suit company, they're making face masks, right? They're having that, they're just having, like people realize that this is in demand, their other stuff isn't in demand, so they know that they need to allocate resources towards those things. Um, Tesla. Tesla is making ventilators. Now, you know, I don't, like, the, how much is the price system determining this? But the idea is, like, people know when it, like, Tesla normally is not going to make ventilators, but they know today it's in demand, so they're going to make them, okay? Well, when you melt down all of your metal to make garbage, how much are people going to pay for that garbage? nothing, right? There, No one is going to pay for that. And so a doctor who's, you know, a skilled profession, someone who gets paid well, there's no way a doctor's like, oh, I'm going to leave my high paying job to go produce garbage that's not going to get anything, right? Like no one in their right mind, no one, no, okay, not no one in their right mind, no one in a market economy is going to devote all of these resources towards making this garbage steal. But the government has strong powers to coerce people into doing this. Remember, like the government controls resources. If you aren't going to go work on steel farms, no food for you. If you're not going to do these kind of things, like, hey, remember we used to kill people to get these, this money, uh, this land? Like there are 
really strong powers by the government to be able to come in and convince people to do this, right? So even though you wouldn't do this normally, the government can force resources there. Another part of this great leap was a push in agriculture. So that's a push in industry, right? We're going to put a ton of workers in there. We're going to try and produce steel using garbage. We're going to just do all these things. But we also need agriculture. This is one of the crazy things, okay? The state set agricultural targets. That is, this is how much grain each province should produce. I'm sure they're based on historical measures like, oh, okay, this is your population. This is your normal grain yield. So we expect you to be able to produce this much. Probably sort of reasonable targets. Local government officials were pressured to meet the quotas. Okay. So <laughs> what do you think is going to happen when you have, so this is, do, 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 do. Um, here we go. We're going to have, this is your quota. It's going to be a level. Burr. Quota. If you reach this quota, so if you hit here, good day. If you hit here, dead. Well, what now, what kind of incentive do we create here? If here you're all right, here you're dead. And by the way, if your province does really well, like up here, I mean, that's, that's, that's big starness right there. Boom, okay? Promotions. If you can get your... Uh, if you can get your collective to produce above the quota, you'll, you're, you must be a good leader. Okay, what kind of incentives does this create when it's really hard to verify this, right? This is just me telling you this is where we're falling. I have to tell you one of these three numbers. And it's really hard for you to verify whether I actually hit which of these numbers. Which number do you think I'm going to say? doesn't matter what the reality is, right? I now have this incentive to say, oh yeah, our province, man, we are just killing it this year. You should see how hard they're working. All strong comrades working towards communist goals. We're doing really well. So these local officials start falsifying the data on how much grain they produce. And it's just like huge exaggerations of actual produ production because there's no way for them to verify it anyway. So the one uh, one economic historian says if just 70% of the numbers were like if if it was at 70% of the level of what they were reporting it would be just the land of plenty right like you could lose 30% of what they said they were they had and you would still have so much food and mao and the central government they're like oh man look at how well communism is doing we're just things are going great i mean why why should we we be worried um, this is where we get to, <laughs> to the, uh, the modern day application. Um, let me see if I can find this article. Um, I saw it just the other day. Yeah. Um, so let me, let me turn on my display capture again. Why isn't it turning on? There it is. Okay. This is from just a month ago. The district governments of the metropolis that comprises Wuhan, the epicenter of the coronavirus outbreak in China, have announced plans to give cash rewards to local residential areas that have successfully curbed the spread of COVID-19. The incentive rules stipulate that regions and large facilities such as rural villages and apartment complexes will receive up to 500,000 yuan, that is $72,000 American, for reporting no new cases of, of infection. <laughs> the policies were in line with a high-level initiative launched by the Wuhan Municipal Government on March 1st that mandates every resident to be thoroughly examined. Okay, guess what? This is modern-day application of what we're talking about right here. This is, okay, we want no, no new cases. No new cases, right? And guess what? If you have no new cases, money, money. What happens in this world when it's really hard to verify whether you have no new cases or not? Wow, suddenly Wuhan and China in general just did not have new cases, right? Like, it's crazy how effective China has been in the past few weeks fighting this virus, right? There's no way there are crazy deaths going on. 
behind the scenes, right? They, they totally have this under control. There's no weird incentives that would skew the data, right? It's worse than that, okay? So we already have this terrible situation where we have these terrible incentives to get people to lie about how much grain they're producing. But it gets worse than that, okay? Here, let's draw this out. Um, let's say your province has a goal, a, a quota of 50, okay? You're supposed to hit 50. Um, your province produces 70, okay? You actually have a pretty good year. Boom, okay? You don't even have to lie. You've already passed your quota. Fantastic, okay? But the official, so, so that means you get to keep whatever's over your quota. So you get to keep, your province gets to keep 20, okay? My, man, my handwriting is on point today. This is fantastic, okay? So, you know, I don't have to lie, but 70 is nice, but 100 would sound amazing. I, as the official, I'm going to announce that we actually produced 100 whatever units of this is, right? We did really, really well. Well, the government says, man, you guys are doing so well. Left over, right? Man, great deal. You are helping out China. You're getting a ton. This is great for us, right? But that 40 is not real, okay? There's not actually 40 units of grain for them to take. They, they have 70 grain. The government took 60. So there's only 10 left by lying. It's not like there's no punishment to lying. This lying has led to the government taking away more grain than normal. You only have half as much of what you, your province would have had. This is crazy. This is nuts. That the, and so you have like these bad reporting incentives. You have these targets. You have this appropriation. And so now farmers are losing their food to the government. There's just not enough food to feed these people. Because, I mean, imagine this isn't even a case of, like, like let's, let's imagine instead of taking 60, they had taken 70, right? They take all the extra food, like, oh, you'll still have 30 left over. No, that 30 is not real at all. So now you've lost all the food that your province was going to have. What are you supposed to do? It's crazy. Okay, shifted a ton of people over into industry, right? We've melted down all of our metal. We are now, um, we've got these crazy agricultural targets, right? It can't get any worse than what's happening there, right? No, no, it can't. It can. This is the part that's just like so sad and yet just so flipping funny. I'm sorry, it's really bad, but it makes me laugh every time. Okay. In 1958, Mao has another great idea to increase agricultural output, right? Our harvest is being destroyed by pests. So if we get rid of the pests, we can keep more of our agriculture, which is a logical idea, right? Like we do that. We have pesticides, right? We have pests who eat our grains. And we say, like, let's kill off those pests. So that way we can have more of our grain. Makes sense, right? We, we have that problem everywhere. Well, Mao creates what he calls the four pest campaign. He wants to eliminate rats, flies, mosquitoes, and sparrows. If we just get rid of these things, we will have more grain output. Well, there's a problem here, though. There's a problem. Sparrows eat grain, but what else do they eat? What else could sparrows possibly eat that might be good to have them around? Well, let's... Uh, <laughs> Let's see what, uh, let's get back to this. I've got another YouTube video. Um, I, I wish, so th the problem here is that you actually don't have great audio on this one. Let me, let me mute the audio because it's in German. I'm sure we have some German speakers here, but let me, let me turn this on. This is the Four Sparrows Mao campaign. Nicht um, so here we have all these people. So how do they get rid of the sparrows? So they actually bring people out of the villages and say, we are going to kill the sparrows. So what they do is they just start waving flags around. They start banging pots and pans and cymbals 
to just keep the sparrows flying and flying and flying. And, and the sparrows never want to land because of all the noise and all the things that are bothering them. Well, then they just get exhausted flying around and they die from exhaustion. Right? They just pull all these people out here. Let's just get everybody out here. And of course, they're going to have incentives like, okay, let's let's kill off the sparrows. Let's shoot them. Let's bring them down. That's my favorite death. I'm sorry. It's so funny. And so they collect all these sparrows. And they're getting ready to sell them. They're selling them by the, I mean, by the dozen. Literally, like, here they are collecting all these sparrows, getting ready to just send them out, okay? Okay crazy that the government was able to mobilize resources like this, right? This is the same as the steel furnaces, right? We want everybody to go melt down them, their metals, so we're just going to force everybody out there to get them to melt down their metal. And we can do that because we have such control. Hey, we want to get rid of sparrows. What are we going to do? We're just going to send everybody out to just take the sparrows out. Like, let's just kill all the sparrows. We're going to have this crazy campaign. And they succeed. Within that season, they're able to kill off all of the sparrows. But the problem is, as you can see here in these subtitles, China had to import... Oh, I guess... Let me uh, let me explain what happens here. I guess we don't quite need that anymore. Um, what happens is that sparrows eat bugs. And bugs eat grain, right? So now you don't have the natural predator of this thing that's eating your grain. And so it just flourishes. So it, they describe it as like clouds of locusts that descend on the fields and just eat up the entire fields. And so they actually lose so much of their, their harvest is decimated that next season. They thought they were going to have this amazing harvest by killing off the sparrows, but instead you have to realize that they eat these bugs. And so those bugs just come in and destroy everything. It gets so bad that they have to actually import millions of sparrows from the Soviet Union. They call up the Soviet Union. They're like, hey, we don't have any sparrows anymore. Can you please send sparrows to our country to eat the bugs for us? Oh, what happened to your sparrows? Like, let's not talk about that. It is crazy. Crazy what's happening here, guys. Like, it's just... I mean, doesn't this... Doesn't this make you appreciate what we have? <laughs> like, that we're not just in this crazy situation where the government's like, yeah, we want to get rid of something and we just throw everybody out there. I mean, I guess, like, even right now, we have this, we want to get rid of this virus. So, what are we going to do? We're going to tell everybody to just take their classes online, everybody to shut down. Yes, Layton, I know decimated means taken down to one tenth, and it probably was about that. So, just crazy, right? Like even even though we have some orders here, it's not like the entire world has actually shut down, right? There are still people out there working. There are still resources going to what they need to go to. This is a totally different world. So with all of this, the Great Leap has really hurt agriculture. Think about all the things that did hurt agriculture. Pulls workers away from agriculture, tells them to go work in industry. Workers made steel in their backyard furnaces, right? Well, let's think about what happens here. What is you? What kind of metal do you have around your house in your community that you can melt down to steel? Well, farming tools, right? You need farming tools like hose or any other type of scythe, whatever it is. But now you've just melted those down to create garbage steel. So you had your nice thing and you turned it into garbage. The food that they did produce was taken by the government because the local officials had overstated the production. And then you kill all the sparrows and allow the pests to reproduce and destroy the meager harvest you actually had. And to top it all off, there were drought conditions that same year. You know, not a terrible drought, but you did have, an, you know, this is just kind of, this is like having an earthquake hit right when you have a crazy pandemic going on. It's like, man, really? Like the biggest earthquake in 30 years has hit exactly at the same time that we're having this crazy pandemic season. This leads to the Great Famine, the Great Chinese Famine. This lasts from 1958 to 1962, okay? 
Estimates vary, but the low end is that there were 15 million deaths over this time, 45 million at the high end. Okay, it, it's so hard for us to know exactly how many people died, but a ton, right? The peak annual death rate was 25 deaths per 1,000 people. Today, our death rate is 8.2, and that's just like, you know, most of those are like old people and then a few babies and then just like random people throughout, right? Like this is four times as many deaths a day than you normally see. And you see this right here, like this 1960 figure, right? Man, that is scary to see death rates that high. And of course, this isn't the same effect all over. So that, okay, this blue line that I'm showing you right here, that is the same as this blue line right here, right? Huge peak. Looks like nothing here because this is a province in China. This is the Anhui province where their death rate was on the order of like 70 per thousand people dying like crazy. So there's huge different effects throughout the country. Not everybody's going through this famine in the same way. And so you have this massive variation. You have these just terrible deaths. The Anhui province is where the post, the post, the podcast you listen to happened. And it's not hard to imagine with these kind of death rates, right? With so many people dying. With your, you're watching your family die. You're watching your children die. Your neighbors die. Because the government has just ripped away all of your resources. It's no wonder people would be desperate for a change. The consensus is that the famine was man-made. Okay, so um, it could have, the consensus is that it could have been entirely avoided if the Chinese government hadn't been so controlling. The problem was, wasn't that there wasn't enough food. There was enough food. It was that no one knew who had more food and, than they needed and who had less, right? Like, and so Mao is like stubborn at this point. Mao is saying like, oh no, everything's fine here. And he's sending food out of the country. He's deliberately sending food to other countries because he wants to show, oh, we have enough food. We're fine. And you have people saying like, it looks like people are dying. Are you sure you don't want us to send you food? And Mao's like, no, we are fine. Communism's great. Nothing's wrong here, okay? This is, you know, you don't have anyone to say who needs food, right? And this gets goes back to coast. Remember when we talked about um, the firm and how we d distribute resources? We had managers. This would be like the government versus the market. And we talked about how like, yeah, managers might be fine in a firm in a small case where you have these transaction costs. But then like in an economy-wide situation, prices do a fantastic job of distributing resources. This was a hurricane hits Florida. They need lumber. How do we get lumber there? They raise the prices. They say, we're willing to pay more. And so we send lumber down there. Okay, And so this is... Um, but you don't have prices here. You don't have people saying like, hey, we're running out of food. The Anhui province can't say, we need food and we are willing to pay whatever it takes to get that food. That's not allowed. Those kind of transactions are illegal. And so you don't have food going to the people who need it. And so they had tons of grain in storage. They're sending grain to other countries. You have all this and yet there wasn't... They're, like they could have solved this. They could have solved this. And instead, they let this terrible system kill tens of millions of people because they had no idea how to spread this information, which markets do naturally, okay? So this is, this again, this helps us think about the kind of things that are important for an economy. Think about what, you know, the U.S. has relied largely on markets throughout history. And those markets have done a good job of allocating resources. We've never had something on the order of this happening. We should be grateful for these markets that prevent us from these terrible situations, human lives, okay? So obviously you have peasant reactions. In the face of all this death, the peasants do not give up. They're like, oh my gosh, we are, yeah, we have to do something. They start abandoning collectives and they start, fighting starvation by starting black markets, right? Oh man, guys, do you realize how important markets are here? Markets are this way for people to find an escape from oppression, for, for individuality, for, for just getting what they need, right? Hey, even in the darkest times, even when millions of people are dying, I can turn to a market. I'm gonna say, I'm willing to sell my labor. I'm willing to sell my services. If somebody's willing to pay me, if I can get food, 
yeah, man, I just, I, I wish that we really appreciated the power of markets here. So Mao sees these activities as a threat to his socialist goals, and he tightens his grips on the country. He stokes class struggles. He, uh, he's blaming the elite for the country's problems. Oh, you know, things were fine, except you know we have these, these hoity-toity elite. They're the reason why things aren't going well. He starts getting rid of art. He gets rid of music, religion, and he p- replaces it all with propaganda. But he's not able to eradicate all the deviants through this. And there are other CCP leaders who are threatening to push him out. And so in response, Mao implements the Cultural Revolution in 1966. And that's to, uh, to purge his enemies. He, he puts loudspeakers to broadcast radio messages, right? Like all in every city, loudspeakers just in the middle of the, uh, the city, just constantly blaring his message of this is the Communist Party's message, right? Just... You're constantly bombarded by that audio. His companions um, challenged a student paramilitary group. They're called the Red Guards. They're like, go out there, destroy all the old ideas, the old culture, the customs, the habits of the exploiting classes. It's these ideas that are keeping you down, and we just need to destroy it, right? Like, there's no reason why we would have these things. It's not like they've been tested over time to keep us out of danger and to keep us away from things that we shouldn't be in. Destroy that. We want the youth to go out there and destroy all these things because it's that. That's what's been oppressing us. And everyone's like, okay, Boomer, we're following you, right? So the death toll is large during the Cultural Revolution. Numbers vary, of course. You know, it's really hard for us to get all these things, but it's probably at least 400,000 people died, possibly up into the millions die from this Cultural Revolution meant to keep people committed to communism. Love it. And then we have Deng, Deng Xiaoping. He's one of the original leaders of the CCP. He initially supported the socialist policies, but when he saw their effects, he realized that the CCP had to adapt. He has this famous saying that says, it doesn't matter whether a cat is black or white. If it catches mice, it is a good cat. And that is referring to communism and socialism. He's saying, look, it doesn't matter if it's communism or socialism. As long as it improves our well-being, it's a good policy. We want the policies that are going to improve our well-being. And because Deng is ready to switch to capitalist policies, Mao targets him during the Cultural Revolution. And Mao sends Deng to work in a factory, some factory in some remote area. Um, I don't know why he doesn't just kill him. I'm sure somebody who's more familiar with Chinese history and Chinese politics can say, like, oh, he didn't want to kill him, maybe because there were, like, too many connections there. But the point is, Deng gets sent away, but in 1974, Mao brought him back because now there's all this fighting going in within the Communist Party. Mao thinks if he brings Deng back, things will be fine. Two years later, Mao dies in 1976, and Deng Xiaoping comes to power. He comes to take over the Chinese Communist Party. Okay, So I started off that section by saying what happened to China under Mao It crashed and burned. It started off as this poor agricultural country, and it was just beaten to the ground under Mao. What happens to China under Deng Xiaoping? By the way, we should have our watch party submission now. Let me know. Send me a picture of you watching this uh, this live stream, and tell me where you would like to visit. Um, I I would like to visit what the area I'm going to talk about right now. But once this uh, once this pandemic's done. Where do you want to travel to? Let me know. Okay. What happened to China under Deng Xiaoping? This is where we get to the podcast. I really hope you listen to the podcast. This is the Planet Money podcast on the secret document that transformed China. This, it is this podcast that inspired me to have this entire lecture. I remember exactly where I was when I listened to this podcast. I was in the parking lot of the Target in San City, California. And I like spent a little bit longer looking for a parking spot because this podcast was just hitting me so deeply. Like it was a spiritual experience for me to listen to this. So really hope that you go back and if you haven't listened to it, please do. If you did listen to it, I encourage you to go listen to it again. Here's a summary of what happened in the podcast. 1978. Rural agricultural workers are struggling to feed themselves. They're in the Anhuin province in a village called Xiaogong. A few families in Xiaogong realize 
that the way that they need to overcome their struggles, they're just going to break the law. They're not going to do a collective anymore. They're going to work on private farms. And so they sign a pact agreeing to rebellion. They're going to work on their private plots. And if anyone is caught and punished, the remaining signers will care for the surviving family. Their agriculture, as a result, thrives. They have property rights. They assign private property to each other. Now they have this incentive to cultivate the land for themselves. As a result, all of a sudden their agriculture thrives and the government's like, wait, what's going on? And they realize what they're doing and they report them up the chain. But instead of punishing them, the government encourages them because now Deng Xiaoping is in charge, right? Deng Xiaoping comes into power in 1976 and he says, it doesn't matter if a cat is black or white. He says, look, we want people to, we want people to thrive. And if this is the way that people are going to thrive. That's how we're going to do it. And so this is a statue in Xiaogong. Uh, it's called 18 Red Hand Imprints. This is where I want to visit. I want to see this thing. Um, you know, for this channel, I would love to do a video where I go there and just talk about this story because this is inspiring. This is on the level of like the signers of the Declaration of Independence. These 18 men who come together, meeting in secret to try and save their families. That was their main goal was saving their families. And what they did ends up transforming China because Xiaogong's success quickly spreads. People realize like, hey, Everyone's starving except Xiao Gong. Xiao Gong's doing really well. And the Chinese leadership said that households instead of collectives should be the unit of agricultural organization. And so they call this the household responsibility system. They move quickly to instead of collectives, here, everybody farm your own land. So in 1980, there was like 0.02% of agriculture was coming from households. And three years later, it was 98% of agriculture coming from households. There's this massive shift back towards putting responsibility on households. Not having collective agriculture, but just saying, you guys are going to farm this and fulfill these things on your own. And the central government significantly reduced quotas and allowed any excess output to be sold on the market. Okay, Again, we're, we're introducing all of these ideas... Uh, sorry, I've got. Oh, good question. I always have. I have this ready-made response. Why? You know, why do people still love Mao so much? You know, why do people still like Hitler? There are still people who like Hitler, right? Okay. So we're shifting. The big thing that's happening under Deng is the shift from communism to market-oriented policies. More privatization, more market-oriented policies, okay? Um, from 1980 to 2000, you have this big shift towards privatization and markets. You have privatization of factories. You're opening to foreign investment. You have decentralization. You're giving more control to local provinces. You're reducing trade barriers. By 2001, China joins the World Trade Organization, right? Everything about this movement is going away from most of the central communist economic policies and going more towards a capital -like, capitalist-like system. Huge shift right here. Uh, this is just some charts on like the shift in state-controlled or private ownership. I mean, the trend is you're seeing this big decline in state ownership, this big increase in, um, in private ownership. Uh, same thing here. I, I want to keep going. Okay. And as a result, as a result, China has this unprecedented growth. And look at this thing. Let me, let me expand this so you can appreciate this more. Um, you have this, you know, let me, let me get the mouse. So you have this time period. This is communism, right? It's growing fine. But then this is when Deng comes in and suddenly you have this just massive growth. 7% per year. Overtaking... U.S. real GDP. This is not real GDP per capita, but in terms of how large the economy is, China is now the world's largest economy. Um, so we've had this huge unprecedented pace, and the reason why um, he, the reason why he was able to do this, was because you had this big shift towards privatization and markets, more towards capitalism type things, right? So communism and collectivism collectivization ruined China, killed millions of people. And the unprecedented growth came because reformers, primarily Deng Xiaoping, 
adopted market-oriented policy. Now, China has not completed the move away from the socialist economic policies, um, so there may be some col- policies capable of promoting growth. But overall, China confirms our models. This is, this is why we talk about China here, right? We've talked about the U.S. We've talked about markets. We've talked about inclusive institutions. We've talked about all these things. And now we get to see this crazy situation where you have like the opposite of all this. And you get to see when you do the opposite of these things, you destroy your economy. And then even, even when you destroy your economy, when you make these reforms and come back to these more market-based reforms, you see this amazing growth. I, that's, I hope you appreciate how important markets are and these capitalist-type reforms towards making sure that we have a prosperous world in society. It's fantastic. I love this lecture for that comparison. In the final few minutes, let's talk about how China's growth has affected the United States. There's a lot of China anxiety. Uh, This is an old Donald Trump tweet. Uh, I mean, you can find basically daily tweets from Trump about China. My favorite China anxiety comes from the great Michael Scott, who said, My whole life I believed America was number one, not America is number two. England is number two. China should be like eight, right? Like there's a whole episode of The Office on China anxiety. It's, It's a fantastic quote. Let's talk about how China's rise has affected the United States. This is, this red dotted line is manufacturing employment as a share of the population. And you can see that it has been declining since the 80s. At the same time, this is Chinese imports coming into the United States. They've been rising. The question is, is this related? Is it that because we have more imports from China, that we're seeing a decline in manufacturing here in the United States. Well, for us to understand this, that's a causal statement. Like, is, the, is China causing a decline in manufacturing in the United States? Well, we need some sort of counterfactual. And so these economists, they're David Otter, uh, David Dorn. Are they all? They're not all named David. There's Otter, Dorn, and Hansen. Um, they have this paper where they look at These different, they split up the United States into what are called commuting zones. You don't need to really know what that is. But what you have here is these different regions, they all have different levels of employment in in manufacturing. This is going to be their level of exposure to competition with China. And so we can actually look here. If you look at uh, Utah on this map, it's a little hard to see when it's small like this. Let me expand it. The darkest means that that's the most exposure to China. And then the lightest is uh, you have the least exposure. And you can actually see just Utah. You go from north to central Utah, you see every single place, right? Cache Valley, Cache County, high exposure to competition with China. We have Icon, and we have, um, why can't I think of the the steel manufacturing. We have steel manufacturing also, but it's mainly Icon uh, at the time this paper was written. You have um, kind of like the Davis County area, um, Ogden area. They have a lower exposure. They don't have as much manufacturing. By the time you get down to Utah County, hardly any manufacturing, right? You've got these very different levels of exposure. And what we can say is, hey, you know, Utah County is probably pretty similar to Cache County, They've got pretty similar demographics. They've got similar uh, trends and lots of other things. But Cache County is more exposed to competition with China than Utah County. So what happens in Cache County once these Chinese imports come in? I'm getting lots of uh, office quotes in the chat now because Michael Scott. Have you guys been listening to the podcast Office Ladies? That is my guilty pleasure podcast. It is pretty dang funny. It's pretty interesting to go behind the scenes with them. Okay, so what happens? What happens? Well, how does China affect the U.S.? So there's been a whole series of papers on this, using this fact that different counties have different exposure to competition with China. If I'm a manufacturing county, I'm going to be hit differently than if I'm in some other, like if I'm in a service industry, right? So we're going to look at this, and what we find is that Chinese imports decreased manufacturing employment in the U.S. Not that big of a surprise, right? This is what we'd expect under a normal trade model. But this is, it goes like deeper. This is like more the nuanced stuff. This is good, good economics right here. Because you have this higher unemployment, which means 
people losing their manufacturing jobs aren't finding work in other sectors. Normally, when we have these trade models and we say, oh, we should specialize, when we specialize, that means you have people moving from the industry they were in into the new specialized industry. But what's happening is that you're not having people leave manufacturing and go into this into whatever the service industry is or whatever your new uh, comparative advantage is. People aren't moving. They're not switching. That's bad, right? Turns out most of these are uh, men. Women get pushed out of manufacturing. They have an easier time of finding a job in another sector. Men, they seem to have a really hard time making that switch. Such a, and then these economic effects also affect political and social life. So areas that compete with China were more likely to elect more polarized representatives, both Republicans and Democrats, right? Like there's, they're both electing more polarized candidates. Um, they're more likely to vote for Republican uh, presidential candidates, possibly cause Trump's election. I'm not like super convinced about this one, but that's a theory is that the places that had more competition with China also were more supportive of Trump. It also reduces marriage rates um, and changes family structure, most likely because men aren't finding work, right? Men aren't finding work and, or they're the ones who have low earnings and as a result, they're having a harder time getting married. So it's actually changing families as a result. Now, like I, I should go back just one second. This is important for us to understand because we need to understand like the human cost of trade. I'm, you know, I'm big supporter of trade. I think this is important. I think the world is better off when we have this kind of trade. But we need to recognize there's that transition. We talked about this in the Stolper Samuelson theorem in the uh, international trade lecture. When you have trade, somebody has to be hurt. Somebody ha like the total gains outweigh how much that person's hurt. But somebody has to be hurt when you have this switch to trade. And we see that. And we should recognize that. And we should be empathetic to those people who are actually by this. So in conclusion, let me go to the China's effect on China. China's growth has lifted hundreds of millions of people. And it's just shrunk incredibly over the last 20 to 30 years. And a lot of that is because China has just become so much better off. And when we evaluate the effects of China's growth, the effects of the U.S. are important but we should also consider it's a pretty small negative relative to this huge positive. We should recognize and value Chinese lives as much as we value American lives. Like I understand that that's controversial when we're talking about policy, but in terms of just like human dignity, I am so excited to see how many people have been able to get out of poverty as a result of China shifting towards more market-oriented policies. That's something that we should celebrate. After the exam, we're going to talk about inequality. We're going to talk a little bit about how we measure these things. Um, I cannot believe the semester's almost done. I mean, I guess because the end of the semester has just been crazy long. Um, there is an exam on Thursday. I sent you the details on Canvas. Please check that out. As a result, there will not be a live stream this Thursday. Um, take your time to take that exam. You're good, honest people. I trust you. I know that you're going to do well on this exam. I know that you're going to do what you're supposed to on this exam. I appreciate you coming in and paying attention during this live stream. I appreciate that we're making our best through this. Thank you so much. Um, I'll see you one week from today on the next live stream when we talk about inequality and how we measure it. Thanks for being in touch. And send me an email if you have any questions. I'll see you.